Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Emily Cash with the Freight Waves Media Team, and I'm happy to present this webinar in partnership with Locus. Today, we'll be sharing insights about supply chain trends then versus now, anticipated trends over the next 20 years, and technologies that can help to future-proof supply chains. I'm happy to be joined by Dan Vandenbrink, Vice President of Global Product Strategy at Locus, and my colleague, Kevin Hill, Executive Publisher at FreightWaves. They will also be joining us for a live Q&A following the presentation, so make sure to have your questions ready for them. Before we get started, I'd like to cover just a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you have any issues during the webinar, please feel free to reach out to our team via the audience chat function in your webinar console. Also, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our presenters, please enter those to the Q&A box in your console, and we will answer as many of those as possible during the live audience Q&A following the discussion. We will also be sending over a link to the recording of this webinar tomorrow in case you'd like to view it on demand or share it with your colleagues. At this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dan and Kevin to kick off today's discussion. Great, thanks, Emily. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, and thank you, Loda, Locus and uh, and Dan for, for joining us today. I think we're gonna talk about the future of supply chains, kind of start out where we are right now, current trends, and you know, how supply chains will be running in 2040 and the technology needed to, to take us there. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dan. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And uh, thank you everybody for attending. So, you know, let's, um, you know, we have uh, a bunch of different trends that are happening in supply chain right now. And we've identified three really critical ones that we see transforming supply chains over the next um, 20 years. And one of the key things obviously is, is uh, as we get towards the end of the presentation, how do we mitigate those changes? What does it mean to the overall supply chain structure? And, and how is this gonna impact everybody on the call today? Uh, so with this, you know, we'll start with some of the cost trends uh, we're currently seeing. And uh, Kevin, I'll pass this back off to you to talk a little bit about what uh, Freight Waves has seen in uh, the logistics market in North America. Yeah, so we know that uh, 2018 was uh, starting in, in late 2017, 2018 to the first three quarters. Uh, we, we saw a very volatile market that that calmed tremendously in the fourth quarter of 2018 and throughout 2019. And in 2020, uh, it was it was just really calm. Freight rates were where it didn't really have any volatility. Their you know supply and demand was 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 kind of imbalanced. I, I think supply was a little bit uh, further out in front of demand, and we we saw that in, in the freight markets. Then, then you have the pandemic. You have COVID nineteen. Uh, you have a sudden stop, and then uh, a, a really quick brisk start. And we've seen that. Uh, in, in load volumes and capacity and, and domestic uh, dry van rates, really trucking rates in general. And what we see here on our first chart here in, in Sonar is the outbound turner volume index, which is a proxy for, for load volumes. Uh, in, in the blue, the, the blue mountain, we have this year, 2020. Uh, it's, it's, it's well above 2018, uh, which is the, the, the purple line. In 2019, the, the green line, 2020 uh, saw a real spike in, in, in load volumes and tenders for load volumes saw a lot of rejections on, on that as, as well. So you see, uh, you know, it was it was a, in October that, that you saw the, the lines crisscross where there was more load volume demand or, or tender demand in 2020 than 21, 2021, sorry. Uh, but it is still quite, quite high, especially if you look at historical norms. And let's see, there we go. I think we're, we're at our next chart here um, where we have the tender reject rates and yellow line is 2020 again. The blue mountain is 2021, uh, our current year right here. Uh, and you see 
you know, it's still at 20% rejection rates. If you look at the, the orange, or actually the, the yellow, I'm sorry, the green line, 7.94% uh, was uh, kind of a high watermark in, in 2019. Um, so, so you saw, you know, maybe seven, eight loads out of every 100 were being rejected. You, you flash forward to, to 2020, and you, you're up to 28% at the, at the end of the year here in the fourth quarter. Um, right now, it's, it's still 20%. So it's still a, a very tight market, uh, certainly in certain geographies. And one of those geographies right here is LA. So LAX to, to Dallas, we all know that there's, there's 60, 70, 80 ships at any certain point uh, stuck out in, in Long Beach and in San Pedro Bay. And what you see here is $4.12 is the, the drive-in rate right now from LA to to, to to Dallas, which is is pretty astronomical when you really think about it. It's been steady like that for at least the last few months. It, it will until this uh, this bottle bottleneck is is cleared out in San Pedro Bay. How that happens? Uh, it could be reduced volumes. It could just be worked out in, in, in the mix. Um, we'll, we'll see what the new variant uh, of COVID brings to. Uh, consumer behavior as well. But, but you're seeing these elevated rates. Um, the, the capacity has been constrained in the domestic truckload market for a variety of reasons, uh, competition uh, for, for drivers. Uh, there, there's a real driver shortage over the last, uh, well, since really the pandemic began. And in load volumes, American consumer is, is buying tangible items uh, rather than services. And you, you've seen this shift uh, we, we look for it to, to shift back sometime next year, but, you know, I, I think after the last couple of years, we can all agree that uh, we don't really know too much. We, there's not much we can forecast right now. So with that, I, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan. And we'll talk about some, some manufacturing uh, data as well. Yeah. And Kevin, you know, just a thought, you know, what are your thoughts about how the uh, full truckload market will evolve over the next 10 years? Do you see these rates still being high, still a lot of capacity shortages? Or uh, again, you know, and even before the COVID uh, outbreak, um, were there some, I'll call it longer term trends that uh, Freightways has observed uh, regarding uh, truckload rates? So there are longer term trends. Uh, you know, we, we have a we have a driver shortage right now based on real time economic conditions. Whether there's a, a driver shortage or a pay shortage, uh, you know, everyone has has their different opinions on that. But it's a cyclical industry, right? And it reacts to it's a byproduct of external shocks. Um, in 2017, it was two hurricanes at once and some regulatory changes. Uh, that were actually internal with the ELDs. Uh, this time, it's been an economy that's kind of been spun on its head a, a couple times, and, and it, it takes a while for that boom and bust cycle to to, to work out. But I, I think you're going to go to a more normal uh, freight market, and that could be it, it's cyclical. And and what timelines that is, uh, who knows? It could be at the back half of 2022. I, I think a month or. Uh, uh, one of the equity and analysts are starting to tap the brakes a little bit. So we'll see mm -hmm. uh, about that uh, as well. But the longer term trend is, is more automation, um, whether that's autonomous driving or, uh, you know, next 10 years, we, we could see a whole rash of at least experimentations on autonomous and, and really just, uh, you know, becoming more efficient. You know, I, I think you're right. going to see a lot of a lot of technologies and, and fuel electric vehicles is going to be a, a huge thing over the next 10 years. That will definitely impact uh, the, the trucking market. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a cyclical um, as well, though. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, obviously, yeah, that that's a, a big part about it uh, with the technology and and specifically just use it using space more effectively within trucks or containers or whatever mm -hmm. you're moving. Um, you know, there's been great progress uh, over the past 10 years, 20 years on that space, but there's still a lot of work yet to be done um, to, to make that, you know, uh, really as efficient as it could be. 
There, there is, and you bring up a good point on efficiently put, putting in space, reducing empty miles. So with uh, autonomous driving uh, and, and also the, the other efficiencies that, that are driving uh, into the market and the automation in, in general with, with technology, uh, software as well, is that you're, you're probably going to see over the next 10 years uh, – it's a very fragmented market, and it's going to be less fragmented in 10 years. Is it yeah. going to be, uh, you know, like the railroads or the ocean carriers where you have 10 dominant players and that's it? No. But I, I think I, I think the fragmentation, right. uh, at least the, the automation and technology will streamline a lot of that to where it doesn't feel so fragmented as, as it does now. Right, yeah. It, you know, and it's, it's interesting. There are two different forces I see in the marketplace. You know, you have... Uh, the large asset carriers and things like that and full truckload that are um, obviously would like to scale more. The difficult part um, with full truckload is that uh, it doesn't require, or doesn't have the economies of scale of like LTL or uh, parcel, right? You're just going from an origin to destination. You're not trying to consolidate a bunch of drop-off points in between it. So the, the industry has always been fragmented that way, but you you have what I'd call the traditional 3PL players that would like to see more consolidation. And then you have some of the brokerages, maybe things like Uber Freight, which, uh, you know, it'd be their interest to keep it as fragmented as they possibly mm -hmm. could. And they become the aggregator of all of this. And they're trying to provide technology out there to keep it that way. And, um, you know, it's always difficult to, to who's going to win in that scenario and how that's going to play out. Uh, uh, both forces are very strong. So. Well, thanks, Kevin, for that piece. You know, I'll go through some of these things. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I really wanted to hit on was just the manufacturing prices. We'll hit a little bit more on the transportation prices and what's happening there. But um, manufacturing prices have really soared, and I think everybody knows this. Um, this is a trend that has really uh, uh, obviously was kicked up doing, due to COVID. This is for the Eurozone. You can see a big impact on uh, in in the eurozone, um, but you know I think there are other factors that are going to keep that going in the future, and I'll, I'll hit on that in a little bit a little bit later about why we see um, increased manufacturing prices going on for a while. Um, you know, for the next twenty years, you know, not completely sure, but definitely for the next five to ten years and. I'll outline why at the end of this segment. Um, the other interesting one, I think everybody's familiar with the uh, ocean freight, which is ridiculously high. I think I read somewhere that like, uh, you know, some of the big firms like Marsk, Maersk have, have basically generated more profit than they have during their entire lifetime uh, this past year. The interesting thing about this, you know, this was really spurned by A, the shutdowns and trying to replenish all the inventories, B, the um, uh, the uh, increase in um, good goods consumption by the in, in the U.S. economy, and I think globally due to the COVID short uh, shutdown, we'll see if that you know goes back to what it was before with services taking up a bigger component, and then obviously also just the imbalances that occurred with all the containers and trying to move things around and the constraints. So all these um, uh, container ships sit in queue for much longer than they did before. So uh, what used to take 100 ships for a certain amount of volume now might take 120 container ships just because they need to plan on spending a lot more time in queue. And I know um, the building has gone up again of new container ships. A lot of them are being procured. Um, in addition to that, at some point, uh, like Kevin said, uh, this backlog is going to alleviate and you're going to get a lot of increased capacity just simply because there won't be as much of a queue or dwell time waiting to get into these ports. And so, you know, this is one where I would think um, or we believe that uh, it's going to take a dramatic drop in the next, uh, you know, definitely, I think, in a couple of years. And I think there's some other trends that are going to limit, um, um, you know, uh, international trade that, that may keep this suppressed. So, um, Kevin, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this this portion yeah i think uh, i think your first point of of the rising prices uh is is something that a lot of people don't think about and, and to expand on it a little bit further i was talking to Lars jensen 
uh, for a virtual conference we did a couple of months ago, Ocean Waves. And, you know, it went, when the pandemic started in, in say, March, April uh, of 2020, uh, all the ocean carriers were looking out or looking into the abyss, right? Uh, it was doomsday, and I remember seeing uh, we, we we get notices here at Freight Waves of, about blank sailings and blank sailing, blank sailing, blank. So 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 they went into uh, a, a really a, a survival mode. The ocean carriers did and shut down a lot of operations, uh, and, but that only lasted for about six weeks or or so. And then all of a sudden, everyone's trapped in their houses. They're they're online. They're buying things. And all of a sudden, the, the orders come in. So they had to shut down and then restart. And you can imagine, the, we were all confused, right, uh, yeah. during, during that Absolutely. point as well. You know, it's like, what do we do? How do we plan? How do we forecast? And it, you, you, a lot of the containers being in the wrong places and, and the imbalances uh, result from that. And it takes, you don't catch up with that in a, a month or two. You know, that's, that's, a, that's right, a, right. you know, 12 month, 18 month uh, repositioning job that you're talking about all over the world, if not longer. And you have this insane demand uh, coming as you're trying to reposition everything. So it's a state of confusion and you can see it in the pricing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and so, you know, this is the final piece. And I think this piece is one, this, this graph just talks about increased tariffs. And this is specifically for appliances. And the point we wanted to make here was that, uh, hey, look, you know, some of these things were happening before COVID. Uh, some of these disruptions were happening before COVID. And I, I think, uh, you know, COVID was so traumatic and had such an impact on the world economy. People forget about the, these longer term trends that were happening, but there's definitely been, uh, you know, much more in the way of tariffs that have been placed on different products. And even today, you know, with semiconductors, you know, you hear it on the news every day. There's definitely much more of a nationalistic approach approach towards trade versus a, a free international trade uh, regime that we saw really since the 90s uh, going for the past uh, 30 years. And I think this is a big trend. Uh, when you look at some of the uh, uh, leaders, you know, this is being emphasized on both sides, both parties. This is a trend and not just within North America, it's, it's across the world right now that we're going to see continue in the future. And um, uh, you know, people are going to be looking to regionalize their supply chains much more as a result of this. So this is one thing I think, you know, when you look at the long term cost, uh, these pieces right here is something that says, hey, you know, we might be able to the, the ocean freight may get resolved. And when you think about it, if this plays out and there's more regionalization, there will be less international ocean freight that should occur as a result. Um, the other piece that I, I think, uh, you know, outside of just the tariffs, uh, the other thing that really happened over the past 30 years is this great period of heavy immigration. Uh, immigration uh, peaked in the United States in like the, the prior decade from 2000 to 2010. Um, it's actually, even though it gets a lot of press and there's a lot of backlog down at Mexico right now, um, it's actually about one tenth of what it was uh, back 20 years ago. So the immigrants coming into the country have uh, really had uh, lowered the labor pool and made it more expensive to hire manufacturing workers. The demographics too, a lot of people are, are um, uh, retiring. And so there, there's not, uh, with the retirement of the baby boomer generation, there aren't gonna be as many people there. So the the costs, the labor costs are gonna continue to increase. And again, we won't have that outlet what we've had before with moving production over to China or other low cost countries because of this tariff and uh, regionalization that's occurring. There's also something that I, I think uh, people don't realize and you see it with fuel right now. Um, oil companies actually aren't investing as much in new exploration because of this large move to green. And the investment that's gonna have to happen to move to green uh, to the low CO2 standards is pretty significant. And it's probably gonna increase expenses, both in the way of the generation of power, but also the taxes that are incurred from it. Um, so this is another trend. When you look at all these different 
trends. Uh, you know, I think we talked about this earlier, the transportation costs, you know, might depend on the mode in terms of how that's going to be impacted. Uh, you know, it's it's somewhat uncertain on some of the, um, uh, you know, uh, truckload loads within North America. You've got the trade-off between uh, automation, but also uh, declining in the number of drivers. Uh, but some of these other factors really say that the costs are going to be going up and companies are going to need to look for ways to structure their supply chain to handle the increased costs and try to keep minimize that as much as possible to their end customers. So, so Dane, I have a question for you on that. You know, we're talking about globalization and, and international trade and so these other yeah. dynamics coming in. And, and for the last 20, 30 years, we, we've seen you know asset prices rise, but, but really mm -hmm. consumer prices they're relatively stable, right? I mean, there's been no alarm bells about inflation until, you know, now. And whether that's a temporary inflation, you know, price rise because of supply chain uh, imbalances or, but, but the, the, the trends that, that you laid out, do you think we're, we're going into, you know, decades of, you know, inflation threats for, for consumer goods because of, Less international trade, or, or I think tariffs. So. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I think there's a strong probability of that happening, and and really, the way to counter that is for the Fed to tighten. But that also throws economies into recession, and so it's it's not a great trade off, um, and it's going to be politically very difficult to trade off. Uh, but uh, you know, for the last thirty years of globalization and having that outlet of being able to produce in different regions mm -hmm. um, has had a huge impact on keeping inflation low and keeping interest rates low. So um, all of that is, uh, I, I think, going to be really interesting on how it plays out. You know, you, you never know the timing. And if I did, I always say I would uh, go into investment banking and make a lot more money than uh, doing mm -hmm. the supply chain deal <laughs> yeah. if I had new but. It sure seems like when you look at all the different factors, it sure appears that, um, uh, you know, obviously there's the, the spending that's occurring by governments, which can have an impact on in the loose mm -hmm. policy by the Fed. But there are all these other factors, too, uh, that I don't think are talked about as much that, that seem to increase the risk pretty significantly. So, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Next, we'll just go. Through, yeah. We'll go through some of the uh, production trends. And so with all of this, right, it's uh, we, we talked about uh, the lack of or, you know, more regionalized economies and, and higher labor costs. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do is improve productivity, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about that from a truckload perspective, but more automation um, and more um, um, modularization. Uh, to, to really try to offset some of these other forces that are out there. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the things that really gets a lot of press today is this idea about additive manufacturing and the impact it's having. And here you can see the exponential growth that's happening in additive manufacturing. And if you're, if you're not familiar with it, basically what it is is three-dimensional printers. And they've added a ton of sophistication to these, so it can do a lot of different materials now. Uh, General Electric uses it heavily in aerospace for uh, their jet engines. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with how uh, metal parts used to be produced or still are produced today, it's predominantly by taking material and cutting into it. So you, you actually waste a lot of material and you kind of are limited in what you can do because these cutting tools, whether it's drills, mills, lays, whatever, need a way to get into the part at a specific point. And so additive manufacturing actually lowers the amount of material you need because now you're not cutting away all that material and you make the design much more efficient because you're not as concerned about um, designing a product that's made to be easy to manufacture in kind of the old uh, cutting tool approach. Uh, so this is gonna have a huge impact. And the nice thing about this is you don't necessarily have the same economies of scale you do with these large factories. So these can become very modular and you can put these close to the point of consumption. Uh, one of the areas where this will, I think as, as it, it, it continues to improve and the technology continues to improve is the aftermarket, right? So imagine service depots being able to make their own products today. 
And, uh, you know, that cuts down and improves the efficiency not only of manufacturing, but also you're no longer needing to pack all these parts and move them to a service center. You can just build them there. And essentially you can just move bulk material from a transportation perspective into these service centers and um, very efficiently. So you're not wasting storage space in the trailer or whatever. It's all, you know, a uh, compound. So it can go in a tanker or whatever, much more efficiently. And uh, that's the thing, you know, when you look at some of these larger trends that we see is that the production sites and the scaling down doesn't impact just production. It actually has an impact on transportation and the demand for transportation too. Um, over to the right, uh, this is an article I love. It's from The Economist, and um, it's, a, uh, it's about Pirelli, and uh, they were making tires. Uh, Pirelli's all, always been recognized as, as really one of the leaders in tire technology. And uh, these plants are massive, and they're also um, – um, they're, they're massive, and they're uh, very expensive to get set up. And here you can see what they've done is they've been able to compress that cycle dramatically. So kind of create miniature manufacturing plants uh, that are close to the point of where the demand is actually going to be consumed. And you can also make the product mix uh, align to that regional area so you don't need to cross dock as much to align your uh, product mix in your outbound trailers to um, the point of consumption. Um, and again, this is something, again, there's this interplay between transportation and manufacturing that I think, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about these things independently, but don't look at them maybe systematically and how one impacts the other. Uh, finally, this is uh, another example, uh, you know, uh, a little bit different, um, but it's, it's about farming. And, um, you know, if, if you've seen and, and they've gotten a lot of press lately about these vertical farms and where they're being set up and particularly in urban centers um, where, you know, you can make the right mix for these products for how they're going to be consumed um, in the location of the consumption and um, very effectively with the small square footage, uh, you know, um, cubic footage is, is a different story because of vertical but can create um, these different products. And again, if you think about this becoming more regionalized, um, moving a product close to where it's being consumed, it has a massive impact on the transportation cost. It also has a great impact on um, uh, the quality because uh, there's less time for the product to degrade. It can be you know, picked fresh right there. And conceivably, you could see a situation where the product's actually being grown in the grocery store, behind the grocery store, in one of these vertical farms and easily distributed. But again, all these trends, much more, uh, these technology trends are going to make the regionalization much easier to do and also um, uh, uh, reduce the need for some of the outbound transportation that we've seen in the past. I think the, the, the trend there started a few few years ago with, with agriculture and farm the table, uh, which was mm -hmm. a huge trend. And, and you're seeing that, that, that go through the manufacturing space, getting closer to, uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, being closer to where the customers are. I think you've seen that in retail too, uh, over the last few years where the big box retailers have shrank down their, their stores a little bit uh, as well. And, uh, I, I, th I think that that trend, you know, nearshoring, I've, I've heard about for years and years and years, and it's never quite happened. Um, mm -hmm. But but I think going forward, I, I think you're going to see an acceleration in, in nearshoring, uh, moving production closer to the, the really the end consumer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Nike's already doing that with shoes, too, if you mm -hmm. use, you know, some of those shoes, those, those are all automated now. Um, they're expensive still. They're more expensive than their standard uh, uh, shoes. But, um, yeah, absolutely agree. It's an, it's an exciting time from that perspective. So, you know, the final piece is really around customer expectations. And, you know, this is really one of the big uh, driving forces. Unfortunately, I was not able to get the data for the last couple of years. This is from Statistica. But it really talks about the click-to-door speed in the United States and what people expect. Mm -hmm 
you know, it used to be that if you ordered something, uh, you'd expect it to show up. You know, this is just from Amazon, um, you know, five days, six days later, and that was great. Well, you can see now that they've lowered it all the way down to three days by 2018. Um, you know, I can speak anecdotally about my own experience, and I live in a uh, town in central Wisconsin, uh, northeast Wisconsin, called um, Appleton. And they've already got their own Amazon fleet. And oftentimes now they just built out a distribution center close to us, close to the Appleton Airport. We'll get product the same day or the next day. It's really amazing. But this expectation is going to continue to really, you know, focus on uh, reducing um, delivery time and being able to deliver very quickly to the consumer a variety of different uh, products. The final piece, you know, kind of hits to what you were just talking about, Kevin, too. This is from uh, grocery stores, actually. And um, one of the trends we've seen there is uh, in the mid-70s, uh, you know, there were only 9,000 products. Um, and I think I enjoyed that era better because I know whenever I'm sent out to get something, uh, it takes me forever to find it yeah. <laughs> in the store today when I'm getting some help. But um you know, in, in 2019, it was uh, it's at 39,000, but there was an interim step there. It peaked about 2008 at 47,000. So I think, you know, this is, again, uh, combining technology, and, uh, you know, making smaller stores closer to the consumer. Um, one of the things that has really enabled that uh, 39,000 is the advent of uh, AI and machine learning to be able to understand better what products customers really want in a specific region. So they can still feel that they have the selection, but you don't necessarily need to show them everything because uh, certain regions don't buy certain products that frequently. And uh, you can still have high levels of customer or customer uh, satisfaction without having all the products. But the idea here being is that um, you know, the service expectations are through the roof. Uh, still, you know, more home deli delivery, fast delivery, and a lot of SKUs. And I, I echo that, I think on the, the SKU accounts, AI, machine learning, because uh, I always go back to the Pareto effect or, or Pareto law uh, of SKUs, mm -hmm. and SKUs are, are a perfect thing for it. You know, uh, your, your top 20% of, of best-selling SKUs are going to generate 80% of your income and those other 80% on, on yeah. average are going to generate 20%. But, but each region, especially when you're talking about grocery stores, each region has its own uh, Pareto laws in effect, right? So if you're trying to do national di distribution, you got to keep those SKUs. If you don't have the, the technology and automation to kind of analyze different markets, you have to keep those SKUs because th they are selling, but it, it, it's hard to be really quantitative about uh, what you need, but if you move DCs and dis or DCs and, and fulfillment centers closer to the consumer, then that starts working out to your advantage. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So good. Well, here's the final uh, trend, and that's risk. And this one, uh, when I was doing research on this. Project. I think this is something that everybody has uh, talked a lot about with COVID. But this is something that even pre-COVID, again, when you look at some of the geopolitical issues, the tariffs, uh, the dynamic nature, people are paying a lot more attention to. Um, again, going back to what we talked about, you know, when you think about uh, the 90s uh, up to, uh, you know, 2020, there was really an emphasis on making supply chains extremely efficient, but maybe not that resilient. And that was done by trying to find the lowest cost country and then, uh, you know, concentrate all your production, your shipping and everything there. Um, and all of the uh, logistics providers, you know, align their resources the same way. And you saw what happened with COVID. You, you alluded to it earlier, Kevin, when uh, you talk about all these containers being out of place. Like it had run so steadily in, in such a, a normal expected fashion, everybody was really able to optimize thing, but it's everything. But when you, you put a little wrench in it, uh, the whole system became uh, out of whack and in out of balance. And um, one of the interesting studies I find, this was found, this was done by McKenzie and S&P 
the capital, uh, is this idea of what's the impact of risk? And uh, people never really put that into uh, making supply chain decisions in the past. What's truly the, the, the total cost of risk when you're planning out a supply chain? And here you can see they talk about it within different industries. Um, the net present value over 10 years, um, uh, what that would mean for a specific industry, how much risk uh, is out there, how much cost. Essentially, they're trying to put a cost number on that piece. And, and then also, uh, when you put that into their EBIT margin, you know, what kind of EBIT uh, impact will it have uh, for that specific industry? And so the top ones here, uh, you can see are just from a net present value perspective, um, are um, uh, aerospace, automotive, and mining. So um, huge, huge, and this is the percentage of annual uh, EBITDA. Then you can go down, you can see some of the other ones. For every industry, it, man, it has a huge, huge impact in terms of what's going to happen. Um, and even though like medical devices isn't one of the top ones in terms of uh, percentage of EBITDA, it has a huge impact on the margin number. Um, so all of these industries are going to have a huge impact. And so uh, companies are starting to look at risk much differently than what they had in the past. I'm going to go over to the next slide here. And, and I, I think some... Oh, so yeah. sorry, yeah. To, just to interject yeah. really quickly, I, I think one of the, the, the case studies that business schools will be doing in, it probably won't even take 10 years, probably in the next five years, and, and talking about risk is, and efficiencies of supply chain, one of the great case studies is semiconductors. Um, yes. Because that was mm -hmm. very concentrated, the entire world is, is now dependent on semiconductors, and it was very concentrated in, in very few plants and and manufacturing facilities and countries. And we are uh, seeing those effects uh, across multiple industries, automotive being one of those that is deeply affected by oh. uh, the efficiencies over the last decade or two uh, built into to, uh, semiconductors that uh, are, were very fragile, not resilient whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And semiconductors, is it's an industry also that um, very difficult to ramp that up because uh, mm -hmm. you really can't run overtime. It's not like assembling computers. It's more like a farm uh, because you kind of plant the fab. Think of it as a, if, you, if you're, you know, uh, had your own farm, you'd, you'd plant the seed. And then, you know, even if there's a huge amount of demand increase, uh, like in July and August, there's really not much you can do. You can just harvest what you have. And a fab is the same way. Because the incremental cost of creating another chip is so small, it's all capital. I mean, these things cost billions of dollars. So they run these things flat out no matter what, just like a, mm -hmm. a farm. The, the marginal cost is very low. But when you have these imbalances, it uh, becomes very difficult to ramp up production in a short period of time. And that's why they're saying today, you know, it's going to take two, three, four years uh, before a lot of this capacity comes on. Now, what will probably happen just like within the ocean container area is that um, the, uh, uh, the, they'll overbuild and there'll be a huge drop in price too. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, supply but, will get there just about the time when demand falls. Right, and, right. And then you have a crash. Yep, and, and then the capital stops a little bit. But uh, that's definitely what we've seen in semiconductor. And what companies are doing is they're, they're looking at this piece by saying, hey, we can't have everything concentrated in Taiwan, especially with the geopolitical risk there, it needs to be more localized. And so companies are looking at that. That interestingly enough, I think there's an opportunity there too for uh, uh, somebody to come up and make that process more modular. I think uh, right now they're, they're still, and I think you see this for a lot of manufacturing when they're still making a lot of technology improvements, uh, it makes more sense to centralize that. Uh, but in the uh, future, I think especially for low-cost semiconductors, uh, the kind that are impacting automotive, it would be interesting to see if they come up with a more modular manufacturing process. It doesn't require the huge infrastructure investment that you require today for uh, your top-of-line integrated circuits. But, you know, I'll, I'll go through this. You know, you can. I think everybody can read these different points and 
Uh, the idea here is, is that this charts different kinds of risks. And, uh, you know, if you go to the upper left-hand side, it's, it's unanticipated uh, catastrophic events, foreseeable catastrophic events. Um, and then you have, you know, small disruptions that are unanticipated and then foreseeable disruptions. And, you know, companies can plan for all of these things. And I think that's the key thing is to be able to look and understand, hey, we don't know when this is going to happen, but if it does, it can have a real big uh, impact. And understand, you know, should we merely make an effort to, to mitigate against this or, or just, you know, hope it doesn't happen because it's going to happen to everybody. And if it does happen, it's going to happen to everybody. But, you know, the thing that I took away from this um, that uh, is most interesting is the bottom right-hand side where it talks about estimated disruption frequency by duration. And, you know, companies can expect to have every couple of years a one to two week disruption. And I think we've seen that uh, there were floods, you know, uh, that impacted um, Thailand and a lot of the, in Malaysia, where all of the uh, hard disk drives were manufactured, um, really had a huge impact. We saw that with, uh, um, in, in Japan uh, during the tsunami and the Fukushima event, uh, you know, knocking things down for quite a while. So, you know, everybody should anticipate that every couple of years, you're going to have a one to two week disruption, uh, um, uh, two to four week disruption every three years. And then you can see, you know, every five years getting a, a greater than two month disruption, which is a pretty significant disruption. And people need to plan for it. So, you know, one of the things you said, Kevin, early in the presentation is, is about the truckload market and the transportation market trying to recover from this disruption. Again, um, these disruptions aren't going away. I think that's the key message is when you think about it, these are going to continue to happen. And uh, one of the things I think, you know, transportation providers can potentially do uh, is be prepared for those disruptions. And when you think about trying to gain market share or really taking advantage of this opportunity, you talk about uh, ocean freight, uh, you know, uh, the, these large ocean freight companies um, making more profit than they have ever have in their lifetime. It, it, it's, it's not only to, to make sure that you're resilient and you don't get harmed by this, but it's also these disruptions are a huge opportunity for transportation companies uh, um, uh, to gain market share and to, to really profit from some of these things. It, it really is, and I, I think you've seen that over the last 18 months with, with transportation companies, mm -hmm. ocean carriers, domestic truckload, you know, the, the disruptions in the supply chain has been good for transportation companies in, in a whole. Uh, at some point, Things will, will go back in balance, so they'll, they'll bring on more supply than there is demand at the time, and we will see the, the crash, and then that's where it gets cyclical again. Um, so it's always wise to don't bet that these good times are going to roll uh, forever because they, mm -hmm. they invariably don't, and you get stuck into sure. the down cycles, which are very rough. The down cycles are rough, but, you know, when you're in a down cycle, if you're planning for that up cycle... Mm -hmm. You can really, and I, I think the companies that always do well in those uh, cyclical industries are uh, when things are going really well uh, to plan for the downside and mm -hmm. when things are really going poorly to plan for the upside because it's definitely coming. You're um, exactly right. Cool. Well, this is uh, the, the last uh, uh, slide on the risk piece. And this just talks about the shift of, value at play. So when you look at this, this basically is telling you that the uh, uh, blue part of the uh, bar chart there is the amount of um, value that's going to be shifted in terms of where it's produced over the next 10 years. And so you can see like for automotive, for uh, machinery and equipment, electrical equipment, uh, if you go down to communications equipment, huge, huge impact semiconductors, which we were just talking about, we already know, over half of it's going to be moved um, uh, in terms of where it's being produced today. And uh, the other thing to talk about the, the shift that's happening, again, we talked about, you know, uh, from 1990 to 2020, if you look at the reasons why, the economic factors would have been top of mind. But now moving forward, these different industries are looking at non-economic factors in terms of making their supply chains more resilient and uh, um, 
able to handle you know these different events that might occur um, rather than just the cost component. Uh, the only one that seems to be looking more at cost is uh, aerospace and automotive uh, slightly. Um, but um, I take that back. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, computers and electronics is the one that's really doing it and machinery and equipment. But these other ones are really looking at more of the non-economic factors in terms of, um, uh, you know, shifts that they'll make in their supply chain moving forward. And again, that reverberates throughout the entire supply chain. So, you know, uh, just to summarize, where are these trends taking us? So it's going to be collapse and more regionalized supply chains. And then I'll have implications uh, definitely in the transportation sector, manufacturing sector, and everything. And it, and it probably means, uh, it could mean uh, more inflationary pressure. Um, modular and flexible manufacturing closer to the consumer and integrated with distribution. Uh, to me, this, again, will reduce the need for some of the transportation that we have today, uh, making it more efficient. You know, how do we move the, the produce or what we're making closer to the end point? And also, at the same time, it makes the supply chain much more resilient. So, again, if there is an event um, that um, you, you can actually, if, if, a, if a plant gets shut down, you've got multiple plants that you can pull from to deal with the shutdown of this one plant. And again, when those events happen, it puts a strain on the transportation sector because they weren't used to making those lanes being critical in terms of uh, moving goods. And then finally is just this final mile piece uh, and uh, having multiple modes and being able to manage that very effectively. High customer service, meaning that you have enough inventory on hand, uh, the ability to deliver it in an economic uh, pace, making sure that you have uh, the density, being able to use multiple modes depending on the type of uh, product you're, you're, you're shipping and uh, doing that in an effective way is going to be uh, critical. And, you know, here are some key questions I think, you know, everybody should be asking themselves as uh, we move forward. Um, you know, how can we continue to improve service and product offerings while reducing costs, giving all these different pressures? How can we make our supply chain more resilient, keeping the cost competitive? And I think at the same time, you know, when things do tighten up, taking advantage of those uh, uh, events. So, um, you know, you, you make enough money to deal with the downturns that we've talked about earlier. Um, how and when should we restructure the supply chain? So I think the answer for that is different for every industry. I wouldn't recommend everybody just going out and restructuring. Some industries uh, will have different types of economics and different demand points. And you should really optimize your supply chain to make it resilient and uh, cost effective and service effective uh, for your specific industry. Um, when should we use, utilize third parties and when should we build it out ourselves, both from a manufacturing and transportation side? Um, you know, when and where should we uh, regionalize and leverage and when should we scale and leverage large manufacturing sites? Again, every process is different and uh, every industry is different, so it needs to be unique to yourself. And then finally, how do you execute against this, right? You've got this plan, now you need to go through and execute on it. Great um, question. So yeah, thank you. And I don't know if you'd add any to those, Kevin. Um, those are the ones that, uh, you know, we've been thinking about uh, at Locus. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think those are, are pretty comprehensive. What I'd really like to hear, though, are, are questions from our, our audience out here and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and see, see what they're thinking, see, see what the, their questions are. And I think Emily has been monitor monitoring those, and I, I think it's, it, it would be fun to, to answer some of those uh, audience questions. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Uh, let me look in here and see what we have. Let's start with this first question, because we do have some that have already came through, like Kevin mentioned. Are all supply chains moving to this modular manufacturing? Are there industries that are not moving to modular manufacturing? 
Yeah, you know, I think we talked about one, which is semiconductor. So it, it definitely isn't. Uh, economies of scale are uh, really still very important for that industry. Um, so there will be a lot of new capacity that's coming up just due to demand, but um, you'll still have very large facilities that will be in the uh, billions of dollars uh, to make. So um, I, I think, you know, there'll be some uh, processing, some food processing, chemical processing that may still need to be more centralized. But even those, I know, uh, you know, have done work before with some chemical companies. They also have been looking at even doing some of the chemical mixing within their distribution centers to, to you know, get it closer to the consumer. Um, one, one, one question I see here, I think it's uh, everyone talks about Walmart, but isn't Walmart been doing this for years? So they have been bringing the, the question is bringing product closer to the consumer. Absolutely, but they've been, the predominant models have been to bring that over to China, or from China. Um, and they've been very efficient at the distribution of that, uh, both in terms of finding low cost manufacturing over there, bringing it over here and distributing it. But even with Walmart now, there are initiatives about how to, um, uh, how, how to produce and how to source things more locally. And it makes it more responsive. Um, you know, if you ever want to hear a great case study on it, and, and we're actually, I'm actually working with a competitor of theirs, uh, they're kind of asking some of these same questions we brought up, is uh, Zara. So Zara went with this model years ago that was against the grain. If you're familiar with them, they're a fashion manufacturer. And um, they actually, everybody at the time was, uh, you know, sourcing textiles from Bangladesh, Vietnam, China, uh, overseas, uh, maybe in uh, Latin America. But you'd have these textile manufacturing centers. You know, it's always been very manually intensive, uh, very, very um, um, uh, centralized. And, 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 and so as a result, they try to find, you know, the lowest uh, unit labor costs that they can. And um, what Zara did is they took a different approach. They decided to manufacture the product actually very close to their stores. And what that allowed them to do, yes, it was more expensive, but they didn't need to carry as much inventory. So they didn't need to discount as much uh, at the end. You know, in the old model, you'd have to order the goods six months before the product was sold. And if you didn't sell it all, then you had to, to you know, put it through a discount chain or liquidate it in some fashion, or you didn't have enough and you missed out on opportunity. Zara kind of circumvented that, and they, they even though it was more expensive per unit cost, um, they were able to be much more responsive to uh, fashion trends and uh, had less need to actually go ahead and uh, discount product to move it. Um, so, um, you know, that's something I see, uh, uh, um, you know, it's a great example of, of kind of these trade-offs and localization versus uh, offshoring. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other questions that I see here. Uh, do you think the new vaccine mad mandate is affecting supply chain? Um, I would have to say, I, I don't uh, really know. Uh, people out in the audience might know. Uh, I know we have a lot of people in the logistics industry. If that's uh, constraining um, the workforce today, I, I will make a comment. I know a lot of the airlines uh, had that mandate. And uh, just from personal observation, it seemed like there weren't, they've, they've had a lot of difficulty too, ramping up their uh, uh, transportation network again. But it seemed like over Thanksgiving, um, things went fairly smoothly, surprisingly, I have to say. And uh, happy to see that. So, yeah, I, I don't think that the vaccine mandate's really having too much of an effect on the supply chain. I, I think that the, the, the main things with the bottlenecks are, or really a, a switch from services, you know, uh, moving some of the, that services spending, which was traditionally 70% of American GDP, over to that 30% of tangible goods. And that, that has climbed. I think uh, the last retail sales chart I saw, and these aren't exact numbers, but they're, 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 they're a rule of thumb a little bit. It takes about six years to, to raise retail sales by, say, 25%. Uh, we did in about six months last year. And, um, mm -hmm. and when you have that type of spending on retail sales, on tangible goods, uh, you're going to get bottlenecks because the infrastructure, it takes years and decades to build up an infrastructure of 
perceived demand and all of a sudden it, it switches and you have containers out of alignment you have infrastructure you have the port of la and, and long beach who can only even if you go 24 7 you can only unload so many ships because of the, the container space everyone else has to run 24 7 uh drivers are as scared as see right now not necessarily because of vaccine mandate just because you know just these these knock-on effects and then you have uh, warehousing and, and and other labor out there that is very hard to come by and really workers and, and employees in general are very hard to come by so the great res resignation is is a very true thing out there and, yeah. and all companies are, are dealing with that dealing with multiple issues all at once right now and that is uh, showing up in 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 the supply chain and in inflation too we're, we're, I'll have to say I have seen, you know, the the uh, the other question is, have you seen an impact of uh, supply chain disruptions due to lack of vaccination? And that I can definitively say yes. Um, and, uh, you know, customers that, um, uh, you know, I was working with uh, last year, especially in the throes of the uh, pandemic, um, there were a lot of distribution centers that were shut down. A lot of plants that were shut down, you know, food processors shut down uh, because of an outbreak in that facility. And um, what what happened? I, I remember I was working with one distributor. Uh, one of their core distribution uh, centers was down, where they actually had all their low volume parts, and uh, a lot of the low volume parts were just sourced out of that one distribution center, and it really had a huge impact. So. Um, I, I don't know, you know, definitely the vaccine mandate. I think, you know, some people will not go work for companies that have that or will decide to quit. Um, but I definitely saw last year a lot of disruptions from these outbreaks that occurred uh, within specific facilities, creating um, supply chain constraints. That is, yes, that is true. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the final piece I just wanted to go through here uh, was the... Um, you know, what does it mean from a technology uh, perspective? And, um, you know, looking at this, uh, this is, you know, some of the key things where, you know, I think technology can have a huge impact. One is just being able to, I think these first two are, first three are pretty important. One is to really have a digital sandbox where you can kind of play out these different scenarios that we talked about before and see how it would impact your supply chain so that you have an idea and you can almost do like uh, a war game around seeing how you'd handle a specific scenario. And is your supply chain really resilient to that scenario without having to go through it? Um, that can be extremely powerful. Um, the, the next piece is really automated decisioning and what I mean uh, and, and seeing the forest through the trees. A lot of companies, you know, when you look at planners today, whether they're running dispatch systems or SAP, they're just inundated with different alerts and they become numb, numb to it. And they oftentimes um, are so busy trying to alleviate those different alerts that they miss the larger context around why they're happening. And this is where decision technology and AI, uh, you know, if you can automate those simple things, so that uh, planners, dispatchers, managers, leaders can kind of see some of these larger trends that are happening or these bigger risks and anticipate and react to it much faster. Uh, this is really uh, the power of AI and um, um, you know, automating that decision. And it has a huge, you know, there are, that's one of the biggest impacts we see. I mean, the other impact obviously is, is, is automating that it means you need fewer people and I think, you know, that will alleviate a lot of automation is a huge thing to deal with the labor crunch that we have. I don't think it's going to mean a lot of unemployed people. I think it's just going to be able to allow us to operate the way we have in the past with fewer people and higher paid people. Um, so uh, that piece is uh, ex extremely important. And I think making the work more exciting and interesting to people so they're not uh, running around doing repetitive work, but work that's engaging and exciting. Uh, so again, that has a huge impact on recruiting, especially the millennial uh, generation. And finally, just you know, optimizing the end-to-end -end supply chain with the idea of key, of resiliency, um, which I should have put there. So um, 
all of these things are really important. I mean, these other pieces, you know, I talk about on the right hand side, we'll kind of skip over those because we're running out of time. Um, but with that, I wanted to see if, uh, if there are any additional questions. Um, we'll kind of uh, skip through this piece. I will just highlight on this slide right here. This is from Gartner. Uh, but then it, it just really talks about, you know, you need to be able to execute well. That's how you realize it. But a lot of what you do in terms of the design and how you structure your supply chain uh, really impact the overall cost and how resilient it's going to be uh, to these different shocks as they go through the system. And again, the idea of people spend a lot of time on the execution, very little time on uh, the, the strategic uh, long-term planning. At least this has been... This has been my observation um, in the companies that I've worked with. So, um, good. Well, with that, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we can open it up for some additional questions if anybody has additional questions. Um, Dan, unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour. So, okay. um, but I'm sure that you and the team at Locus would be happy to reach out to these people offline that did have additional Absolutely. questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I just want to um, thank you both, Dan and Kevin, for sharing your perspectives. Um, and to thank you to everyone again for taking the time to listen in. And a big thank you to Locus for partnering with us on today's presentation. We hope you'll join us again for our next webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Hey, thanks.